So this section is on cattle and livestock watering. First, what kind of livestock are you watering and how many heads and how much do they drink per day? Example, beef cattle require one gallon per 100 pounds of body weight during cold weather to nearly double two gallons per 100 pounds of body weight during the hottest weather. Uh, lactating cows require nearly twice as much water compared to dry cows. So a 1,000 pound steer will require 20 gallons of water per day in the summer months. This will need to be taken into consideration when deciding how much, uh, how many head per watering tank to determine a good size of watering tank based on the refill rate and the pressure at the watering tank. Hence, keeping your PVC as large as possible coming out of your pond all the way to the end point where the, we break it down to three quarters inch poly pipe to increase the, the uh, pipe pressure is really important. Next section is pastures, recovery rate, and irrigation. Well, we believe in only grass-fed beef, sheep, and goats, and that takes good, healthy pastures, which in turn need good, healthy recovery times. Recovery times for pastures with no irrigation is typically six weeks. After you have highly, densely grazed a pasture with your livestock, you will need to give it six weeks to recover before you can bring those livestock back on the parcel for their next grazing. This is to ensure that the grass has had enough time to recover and grow back to a healthy height, but do not come back earlier than three to four weeks to allow for parasites to hatch and die from the last grazing. Parasites love moisture and heat, so water quickly after the first few days to encourage the grass to grow after grazing and to give a good hatching environment for parasites to quickly hatch and die before the livestock returns. Most common internal parasites are host specific. This means that cattle can help break the cycle for sheep. The same is true for cattle and horses by bringing in sheep or goats. So in other words, if we graze uh, our pasture like we have right here, if we graze our pasture, then six weeks later, or three weeks if we're watering, but six weeks later if we're not watering the pastures, then we should bring back sheep and not, uh, not cattle. And then after we take the sheep off, then six weeks later we can put cattle back on. And that way it gives the parasites a time to hatch, breed, and die because there's nothing parasites have to attach to something. And uh, cattle parasites are looking for cattle and sheep parasites are looking for sheep. So if you do cattle and then six weeks later you bring sheep on and then six weeks later you bring cattle on, uh, those parasites are long dead and hence you don't need to deworm or hardly ever deworm your sheep, cattle, and goats. How amazing is that just to use what's naturally there? This can be done by alteration of species to break parasite life cycles. Utilizing different species is also beneficial in reducing the amount of weeds as each species has a preferred food source, like sheep will eat weeds that cows will not, and goats will eat thorny plants or wooded bark plants which sheep and cows will not, uh, will not eat. In turn, manages your pastures while you minimize parasites in your livestock and need to deworm or otherwise use um, man-made remedies. How cool is this? So irrigation can be used in this process too. Because parasites love wet, warm areas, as soon as we pull a um, uh, cow or sheep or anything off of our high density grazing for that paddock, we can immediately turn on water. So we already have a water source there for the uh, for the animals. So we're just going to run a sprinkler to the top of that water size right off of the Right off of the fence post, we can go up six foot in PVC off of that and just turn sprinklers on to cover as much. You don't need to do all of the pasture, but try to cover at least 80% of that with sprinkler. And immediately that will create a wet environment, perfect for parasites to grow. And it also is perfect for having that grass recover really quickly. So uh, it has a dual purpose. One is to give a great environment for parasites to hatch and grow and die because they can't find the, the host the host animal that they came from. Uh, and second is to irrigate that pasture so that it comes back quicker than six weeks. 
So the recovery rate dictates how much land you need to graze a certain amount of head of livestock. If you are like most people, you can't afford huge tracts of land in order to have enough heads to make a living. And one amazing thing we can do instead of spending loads of money on land is to irrigate in order to speed up the recovery of the grasses and shorten the recovery time, which means you can bring back livestock in about half the time, hence getting double the livestock density from the same exact acreage that you have now. How cool is that? So we will want to have a sprinkler head attached to a fence post in the corners of each of the paddocks to water the paddock the moment the livestock has left from their high density grazing. It's like when the rains come in spring and every vegetation turns green and grows like crazy. We want to mimic this growth spurt by irrigating the pasture as soon as possible after grazing, which also infuses the natural manure quickly to the land and in turn minimizes flies. Okay, in this section we're going to talk about pond health and uh, water quality. Your water's health depends on many factors like oxygenation, aeration, pesticide, herbicides, fertilizers from your watershed, the depth of your water, and diverse ecologies, and on and on. So your water health has a lot of factors. Let's talk first about the largest impact first, the watershed that feeds your pond and introduces clean water or contaminated water into your pond system. If you are using the neighbor's property for your watershed, you have to consider are they growing crops and if they're using fertilizer, pesticides, or herbicides. If they are growing crop, crops, then maybe just go and ask about their production practices and be friendly. So you do not need to tell your neighbor that you're concerned about the type of rainwater that's running off of their watershed onto your lake or land, but more of a general conversation of interest in what they're doing. If they are using fertilizers and herbicides or pesticides, you will want to look at your own land instead of theirs for your watershed. And be sure your watershed is not being fed by a neighboring watershed. That is that if there's a neighbor's property that's higher running onto your watershed, which runs onto your lake, then it's still polluted. So pond placement and watersheds are extremely important. If you look over here, that watershed on the neighboring property feeds this lake. So if they're using pesticides and herbicides over there, it's going to run in our lake. And hence, right from the get-go, our lake is, you know, being contaminated with stuff that we probably don't want if we're doing organic, or anything. We don't want herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizers going all the way down our waterways and down our ditches and feeding all of our trees and our livestock and putting all of those chemicals into all of the things that we eat. So it's really important to, de <coughs> to determine uh, it, you know, if the neighbor's uh, watershed is a good natural watershed that hasn't been used in 50 years for any kind of growing and it's just a great place to feed your lakes. If it is, put your lake as, cro as close to your property line as possible and you use their runoff. And if they are planting and using all those chemicals, pesticides and all that, then you have to consider using your own watershed on your own property. Just make sure that nothing's pouring onto that that would pollute it or has been polluting it for years. Make sure it's a good watershed with a good clean source with nothing else running onto it. You need to know that. Aeration of your pond is the next biggest factor in maintaining good, healthy waters. I always recommend adding an aeration system to your pond. I know, I know, but what about the electric bill on something that runs 12 to 24 hours a day? Don't worry, I will provide you a solar aeration system that is super efficient and produces large amounts of healthy air into your ponds and with no electric bill. Yes, you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> and uh, see the links below for the absolute best quality products and pricing. Uh, without sufficient amounts of healthy aeration, algae can get out of control, fish can die, and overall, overall health of your water system is jeopardized. If we just did the two things we just talked about and nothing else, it would dramatically impact the health of your watering system 
hence the crops you grow and the livestock you eat and sell. It feeds the health of all of your farm and by far the most important input into your farm. Control your water and control the health of your farm through your watering system, your pond system. Installing solar aeration systems is this section. Your aeration system should be installed when you build your pond, just like the irrigation system that we just talked about. It uses the same PVC materials as your irrigation system. We have three different types of solar lake aeration systems. One is a solar direct drive system kit that simply runs only when the sun is out and doesn't pump at night. Two, the more expensive uh, solar system is with battery support, which runs 24 hours a day as long as the battery lasts, but is much more expensive. Or three, D DIY, do it yourself, where we found the best quality parts at the best possible pricing for the best value. But you will have to install and build the system yourself. So if you're a real bona fide farmer with mechanical skills, then this is the best package for you we could put together for the highest value. Yes, yes, yes. We have all the product links with the best internet pricing below. So package number one, the, the solar direct drive system runs when the sun is up, but most air depletion happens at night. So the trick is to pump as much air during the day to sustain aeration overnight. So that one is the cheapest, but it, it has a, a, you know, a, a holdback. Direct drive system kit with battery support should run 24 hours a day, but is much more expensive, but at least overall quality of water keeps on aerating 24 hours a day. So that's inexpensive. So the first one was not so expensive. The next one was very expensive. Not very, but a little bit more expensive if you want the best. And then DYI direct drive with room to expand into battery support if desired. So this system, we picked out all the parts. Instead of just buying a kit, we picked the parts out. And then uh, you're going to build it yourself. And so we'll, give, we'll put all the parts below their prices and then you build it yourself. It's like half as much as the other system. And you can always upgrade it to have a battery support just by adding one component. So we recommend this one if, you're me if you have some mechanical skills. Uh, and this would be the best value for you to get that aeration system. Okay, so let's just talk a little bit about stocking the pond because fish bring a lot of health and uh, life to a pond system. Stocking the pond with fish. Year number one, as soon as your pond is built or your lake, we need to put in fat head minnows. And a rule of thumb is about 1,000 minnows for every acre of land, which is not a lot, sounds like a lot, but you have die off and if you're in cold states there's freezing and there's lots of things and raccoons and everything that eats them and challenges them. Year number two, channel cats and bluegill. The bluegill are the food for the bass and the bluegill ate the fathead minnows for their feed. So. As we start in year one, we put in fathead minnows and those populate the pond and re rebreed and repopulate and makes a lot of food for the bluegill and channel cats. And then the bluegill eat the fathead minnows and then the bass in year number three, when we put the bass in, the bass will feed on the bluegills. And, and this is the thing to know, all this, it takes five pounds of bluegill to grow one pound of bass. Isn't that amazing? So it sounds like a lot of fish, but they're always feeding on each other. And if you have a four pound big bass in your pond, know that it took 20 pounds of bluegill just to make that fish. So uh, let's see, note, always leave a few uh, treetops in the bottom of your pond, no more than eight foot deep to give protection to the small minnows. And note number two, you can borrow water lilies and other beneficial vegetation from surrounding ponds to add to your pond. I mean, why buy for it, buy it when you can have it for free, right? Okay, well that's it. I've spent two full days outlining this video, another full day recording it, 
one day of researching the best quality products at the best possible internet pricing and two full days of editing this amazing video. We love what we do here at Miller Family Farm Channel and ask that you help us by getting 1,000 subscribers so YouTube will start paying us for our video content by clicking subscribe now. And remember to leave us positive comments too as we need encouragement. Uh, and need to know you are loving our videos or what we can do better. Thank you, family. Also, if you're a manufacturer or distributor and would like us to review an outdoor product or want to sponsor our channel, let us know by emailing us at MillerFamilyFarmTrust at gmail.com. Uh, just a little notation for all you manufacturer distributors. We do honest reviews and only endorse quality products to our um, our family here on the Miller Family Farm Channel. So just to let you know if you send it to us, it doesn't get you an automatic great review. We only endorse quality products. Okay, this is about installing our PVC water intake into our lake. <clears throat> The healthiest water in any pond or lake is about 12 to 36 inches from the surface. So when we install our PVC intake piping, we will drill one quarter inch holes in our PVC uh, and uh, from about 12 inches below the water surface, the full level of your pond to about 48 inches below the top surface of your pond. That point, so the uh, so that we get quality water. We drill hundreds of quarter inch holes in the PVC for water intake without being large enough to suck up tadpoles or minnows or uh, you may use smaller drill bits and increase the number of holes if you wish. You can, uh, you can go lower if you like. If you think the water levels will fluctuate a lot from watering and drought uh, conditions then you can drill 12 inches from the top down further but we want to stay at least three foot off the bottom of the pond so the maximum area for drilling would be 12 inches below the surface to three foot from the bottom of your pond. If you have a 16 foot deep pond, that would mean that maximum drill area into your PVC would be 12 feet of drilling area, which would also give you maximum water volume. But if you want the best water quality, you might simply drill 12 inches below the surface to six feet from the bottom of the pond for nine foot of water intake. Note, use two 10 foot T-posts that are rust resistant to strap your water intake to stabilize the PVC pipe. No need to glue the joints as this is not a pressurized intake and the intake holes could become blocked and need cleaning. Hence, if you don't glue it, we can remove the pipe, the PVC pipe, and clean off all the water intake holes and then reinstall that. Yep, you might need to send your kids down there snorkeling, but you can pull it from a boat, just like, you know, take your canoe out there, pull up the pipe, clean it, and then if you can't find the hole putting it back in, then just send one of your kids to, you know, to scuba dive down nine foot uh, <laughs> and install the intake back into the coupler. So let me just show you what I mean by this. So this is a two inch PVC pipe. We're going to drill with a quarter inch or smaller if you like, you just need to do more drilling, but quarter inch holes, we're going to start 12 inches below the water surface. So this will be sticking out the top of the water uh, by uh, about a foot. At the fullest level of your pond, you want this sticking up a foot with a cap on it. So like that, so nothing flies in and plugs up your whole water system. So if this is your water level at full in your pond, then it will be sticking up about a foot above that. And then from this point down, uh, we're going to start drilling down here. So 12 more inches below the water, uh, the surface of the water is where the good water's at. And then we would drill from 12 inches below the water surface all the way down, just little holes, hundreds of them that we will drill in here to take our water, our intake, our water. So. Again, this is 12 inches above the highest point when your lake is full of water, not when you build it, but when it's full of water, it will be 12 inches above. So you can find this pipe. Otherwise, it'll be below the water surface. You'll never find it. And then 12 inches below your water line is where you start drilling at. 
So, uh, so that is, this is where your water's at. We, at, at 12 inches, we start drilling down here. And again, we could drill for four to eight inches and that will keep you in the most highest quality water in your whole system all the way down. Okay, Miller Family Farm Channel. I hope you learned something today about installing your multi-pond irrigation system for your farm or homestead. And really, it doesn't have to be a multi-pond. It could be just one pond with a, you know, with a gigantic uh, swell or ditch that just takes the property and holds it as much as you can on your property as it exits your property. So. So we could do one pond and then just one big swale or ditch system. And then we could put in sills into, into our, our ditch so that every 30 foot is creating like a mini pond. And as it fills up, it goes over that sill into the next one and into the next one. And the main thing to get from this video is we want to hold as much water as possible on our farm. And we use all these techniques, you know, multiple ponds, swales, uh, um, ditches, all that to move water around our property on purpose. And, uh, and then we incorporate that with an irrigation system. Out of our big lakes, we create an irrigation out of PVC, kind of man-made, the other one's natural. And then we get more specific and move water with our PVC uh, to put it where we really need it with pressure and without electric. How cool is that? So I just want to say that I, I really love building these videos. They take a lot of time, but I love doing it, as you can probably tell. And I just want to welcome you to our Miller Family Farm channel. And like, welcome. There are some great people that subscribe to our channel. Uh, there's a lot of farmers, but we do everything outdoors. We do four by four pickup truck builds. We do ATV side by sides, farming, tractors, brush hogging, creating businesses so we can live this lifestyle because farming's not cheap sometimes. <laughs> and so we build everything around outdoors because we love the outdoors and we know you love it too. And that's why you're watching. So subscribe now. Just, I promised you at the end of this video that I would teach you how to get grant money for putting in an irrigation and pond system on your farm. So by the magic of YouTube, poof, here is a copy of the application uh, to put, uh, to complete and turn into your local USDA office. Uh, and once you complete your application and give them your topographical map, the map will show them what you intend to do. and. They will probably refer you to a local uh, builder, pond builder, to actually price it out. So, and if you want a copy of the actual application, just email us at MillerFamilyFarmTrust at gmail.com and we'll send you an actual, actual copy of the application so that you can see what all the requirements are and all that. So email us and we're happy to give that to you. Thank you, Miller Family Farm Channel. We'll see you again soon.